Okay, <clears throat> so today, for once in our lives, we will learn something new. Oh boy. I know, right? How many of you have ever heard me say that ever in any of the classes you've ever been taking? Not, Not once, right? We've always had, I've always introduced you a fun way of flipping something or moving something. Today, we're actually going to introduce you to something quite new, okay? And it's important because it is called Hamiltonian mechanics. <laughs> And can anyone guess why it's called Hamiltonian? There was a guy named Hamilton. Absolutely. There was a guy by the name of William Hamilton. No, he was Irish. 1833. He came up with mechanics that he called Hamiltonian mechanics. And remember when we were talking about Lagrangian, we said it's not actually new, it's just a new way of looking at Newtonian mechanics. This is an actual new formalism that this guy came up with. So Hamilton came up with a new formalism. The good thing about it, however, is that it gives you the same results as Newton's formalism did and Lagrangian formalism did. It would be very strange if he came up with a new formalism of doing a ball falling off the cliff and came up with a different answer, wouldn't it? The answer should finally be the same. So in order to do that, he came up with what is called the Hamilton's principle. So what is the principle of least action? So what do I always say about the universe? Lazy. Good. What does that what should that tell you about the path that some things take? Sure, it was the easiest question. It goes the easiest route, which means it goes the shortest. Um, so yes, the universe is inherently lazy. So it doesn't want to do more work. So the basic principle of least action says that anything when you're given an option will take the shortest path. Got it? Yeah. Okay, now let's write it formally. So Hamiltonian principle says of all the possible ways a system can change in a finite time interval, delta t, the actual motion that will occur is the one for which this integral will assume a maximum, maxima, or minima. And how do we express this principle? You take the first differential and you put it equals to zero. Note I am using a partial here. So L, good question, is your Lagrangian. And that's why I tend to write Lagrangians like this, but not always. So far so good? We have to take the derivative of the integral of L dt and put it equals to zero. That's the only way in math we know how to find maximums and minimums, right? So I'm gonna introduce another term that may, may or may not be new to you. Hamiltonian mechanics, Physical systems 
are described by a set of canonical coordinates. Huh? No, it's canonical. No, not conical, canonical. You might have said it, but I don't think you Okay. So canonical coordinates is a fancy way of saying the number of coordinates that we need in order to describe any system. That's all that means. So for example, if there is a particle, a car moving in a straight line, how many coordinates do you need to draw? How many coordinates do you need to know in order to define the system? One. Which one? X. That's it. So the, cano the canonical coordinates for that particular system is X. Now, if I have a projectile motion that goes like this in 2D, how many canonical coordinates do I need? Which ones? X and Y. Got it? Okay, now what about if I have a coordinate system where the projectile goes like this? X, Y, and Z, how many do you need? Three, X, Y, and Z, got it? Cylindrical system, how many systems do you need? How many coordinates do you need? Which ones? R, how many do you need for your spherical system? R, phi, and theta. So that's all what it means. Now, why does he call it canonical systems? It's because he wants to give you a generalized way of doing mechanics. But think whenever you hear that word, it's not complicated. The word seems complicated, but when you fundamentally understand what they mean, they don't remain co com complicated anymore. Okay, so now let's write the formal definition of it. Ready? Here we go. How do I define a canonical coordinate? a set of coordinates which can be used to describe a physical system completely at any given point in Time. So in classical mechanics, the canonical coordinates are Q and P. We did Qs the other day, right? We did Q and Q dot when we were talking about Lagrangians and we call them generalized coordinates. What was Q? Position, very good. And what is P? Momentum. So for example, when we were doing um, Lagrangians, we talked about Q and Q dot, correct? What was Q? position and what was q dot velocity. right so hamiltonian instead of talking about velocities he talked about momenta and it's interesting to note that when newton wrote his second law he wrote it as what so when hamiltonian was coming up with his mechanics he came up with canonical coordinates, which just means that he was dealing with position and momenta. When Lagrange was dealing with his, his equations, he was dealing with positions and velocities. This is why we call this a new formalism. Then he came up with these two equations that he called his canonical equations of motion. Okay, and I want you to write them in terms of his canonical coordinates, and then I'll show you how to apply them. Good? 
Let's just write them down. Hamilton's canonical equations of motion. Partial H over partial P equals Q dot and partial H over partial P minus P dot. Where we all know what this is, that's just dx over dt, right? And what is this? That is dp over dt. So when you look at this, I want you to think that q is nothing other than x, q dot is nothing other than v of x, and p is momentum, and p dot is dp over dt, which is also the force. Just move an arrow. Nice. There we go. That's Thank you. Yes, these are important. These are called Hamilton's canonical equations of motion. Now, I have not yet defined what H is. H, the Hamiltonian, is defined as T plus V, where T is and V is potential energy. So T is kinetic energy and V is potential energy. Good. 